morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Kipling UMC. We're so glad you're here this morning. It's good to see all of your faces or your masked faces. Um, Whether you're here in person or joining us online through Facebook, we are so glad you are here this morning um, to worship God together. We have a few announcements this morning. Um, We still have our ongoing Lenten Bible study on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Would love for you to join us for that. Um, And or um, the prayer service we have Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. that we just um, go live from the Jameis' house and we do a little music and Justin offers um, a brief reflection on a theme for the week. And so we'd love for you to join us for that. It's usually just about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the Kipling Spring Barbecue is Friday, March 26th. That's this Friday. Wow. I, I've kept that. Totally here. It's this Friday. Does anyone have any? Yes. Uh, we'll be sending out an uh, email or some communication to let you know the times when we put the fork on. We do all the other stuff so that everybody will know when to show up to Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so Ben said he'll be sending out an email with information about that, the barbecue as far as times, Um, and then Scott said there's flyers in the back if you want to pick up a flyer. It has all the information on it, and you can put those wherever you go, right, at your work, at your school, um, so that you get the word out and people can purchase barbecue. Um, We also have a mission and outreach meeting um, if you're on that team or would like to be part of that team. Um, Tomorrow night, uh, right, that's tomorrow, Monday, March 20th, via Zoom. Did I miss anything? Any other announcements? Happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Happy birthday. I turned 21. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) And now, would you join me in the call to worship? And also, and also with you. you. Let's praise God together. Who are uh, battling this disease or have lost somebody to this terrible disease. 
So we hold them in the light of Christ. Remember them. We also prayers for the community of Atlanta, and especially our Asian brothers and sisters. Uh, prayers for the church to, to be a, a way to stop violence towards uh, people of different ethnicities. And so we lift up uh, the city of Atlanta, the, the Asian brothers and sisters that we have in our human family. We hold them in the light of Christ. Uh, prayers closer to home for Ms. Uh, one of our members, stage four melanoma tumors in her brain and in her lungs. And so uh, we hold her in the light of Christ and remember her. She's been taking immunotherapy. We remember her and, and pray for her and her family. Also prayers for Joe. Donna, Alexander, and Joe. He's got bladder cancer. Uh, he had his second chemo treatment postponed because of low hemoglobin and platelets. For Joe Croft. We hold him in the light of Christ. Also prayers for Mike Jackson. Uh, continued prayers for Ms. Jill's brother. Um, prayers for the presence of God to be uh, all over him, surround him. Well, he's been suffering a little bit with yeah. depression, but Absolutely. He, overall, he's kind of keeping as good a spirit as he can. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yes. You so suffering with depression in the midst of, of this diagnosis. So prayers for his spirits to be buoyed by the presence of God and by the, the prayers of the saints. So we remember him, remember your mom, remember your entire family. We hold them in the light of Christ. Uh, prayers for Jan Hatting, who's an Emmaus pilgrim, who's in uh, the hospital with COVID. She's in critical condition. So we lift her up and hold her in the light of Christ. An update uh, on Danny Brown. He's continuing to make progress. He's doing better. And so uh, praise God for that. I know it's a long road. And so continue prayers for strength and for, for his journey. Uh, prayers for Mike Meehan's cousin, who's in the hospital with severe health issues. We hold, uh, it's a her. What's her name? Danielle. Danielle. We hold Danielle in the light of Christ and remember her. And also prayers for uh, Shelby's grandma, who's got macular degeneration. And so we hold her in the light of Christ and remember her. Several joys. One of these flowers are beautiful. So thanks, Miss Billy. Miss Billy brought these from her house. Uh, we're going to be talking about the love of God today. I said this is like a fire uh, right here on the altar that reminds us. It's getting warmer in the spring, it's here so we can get outside. I'm also grateful for the little things like uh, March Madness. I don't know about y'all, but I like, I like watching basketball, so I can give thanks to God uh, today that my Jayhawks are still dancing, at least for a little bit longer, uh, probably not much longer, uh, but prayers, uh, prayers of, of joy for that. Any other prayers or praises that you want to lift up this morning? Any, anything Praise that not God that storm is. I know, I know. We, I had kids who were home from school because of uh, the storm that's coming, and, and praise God for that. And prayers for all our brothers and sisters who did have to deal with uh, tornadic activity and strong winds, and uh, we pray for them. But thank goodness, yeah, thank goodness for that. Continued prayers for our sisters and brothers in the in the Texas area who are still cleaning up after the the freeze and the flooding that happened from frozen pipes. We hold them in the light of Christ. Any other prayers or praises this morning? Now, I'm going to say something. Yeah, please, please. <laughs> um, I watched Wednesday night. Yeah. Well, I want to make a suggestion. Yes. I think those two girls ought to give us some entertainment here. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great suggestion. Du <laughs> Pastor, duly noted. Shelby, you, it's, it's been recommended. Hey, I think Christian. It's I think it's great. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Krisha's in my office and I'm in a meeting right now, so I'll tell her. We've got Krisha, we've got Shelby. It'd be wonderful. You want to, the, the guy that plays guitar, he's just okay. <laughs> you can't see him, but, but he's fantastic. We can, we can bring those guys as well. So, Yes, absolutely. Any other prayers or praises? Yeah, Tyler. Um, my, my prayers are for Jeff Hall. Prayers for Grandpa in Idaho, who's not doing well. So we pray for him. And pray for his healing and pray for God to surround him in his presence. Thank you. Glad you lifted him up. Yeah, Quinn. Grace with boldness. Would you join me in prayer? Gracious and loving God, God forgive us today we give you thanks for the ability to gather in worship, whether in person or online, to be greeted by your spirit and by the goodness of your grace and light and love and truth and beauty. We give you So the 
continuing some things you mentioned there. And so we have this confidence in company all the you are. You and we pray uh, that you'd stir us, stir your church for justice, and we, we would put an end to hate crimes, that you would help us uh, to know how to stir uh, love and acceptance of diversity. Oh God, grant us the gift of your spirit. We pray for our brothers and sisters who've been affected by those acts of violence this week, and pray that you would surround them with your goodness and grace, and that they would love God, we pray for uh, all those who've had to deal with storms, uh, from fires uh, to uh, ice storms and floods from bursted pipes to tornadic activity. We pray for those who have cleaned uh, workage. We pray that you would surround the prayer you would ask your church to know how to respond in this case. We also look for all those who have been these COVID 19. We know that as far as so is yours, that, that you do not grow weary in, in hearing our prayers. You do not grow weary in uh, responding with your faithful presence. And so we give thanks for all of the doctors and nurses and family members and friends who, uh, who embody your goodness and grace and love. And we pray uh, for all of those who are mourning. We pray for all those who are battling it. We pray for all of those uh, who need to feel your presence. Pray that. They would encounter that afresh and anew this morning. And pray that uh, this week as we uh, have this barbecue, oh God, that uh, not only as we make this pork and share, uh, it might be a, a, a gift and a boon to this community, that they might experience your love uh, through us and through our service in this way. God, now we join our prayers with a prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, power to be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. I now invite Ms. Shelby to come forward. Uh, she has a message for us, and Dan's got a mic for you. So uh, we invite our children to come forward as well. Is this a moment for our youngest disciple?
it lasts forever, right? Even longer, even stronger than a permanent marker, right? Because the permanent marker fades away. But lasting means that it never fades away. It, it can't be erased. It can't be washed away. God's love for us is everlasting. And it's written where? In our hearts. Heart. In our hearts. Can you say it with me? God's love God's is, love is, is in our hearts. God's love is written in our hearts, and it's what? What's the E word? Everlasting. Awesome job. That's what I want you to remember today. Can you hear me? Dear God, we thank you that your love for us and for these children, for each one of your children, is not something that can be erased or washed away or that fades away, but it is everlasting. It lasts forever for all time. And it's for all of us. It's written on our hearts, and it will never go away. You love us so much, Lord, and we love you too. And we thank you for the way that you love us and care for us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. you join me in the prayer of confession as we confess um, individually and as a church the ways that we have failed to love all of our brothers and sisters, the ways we have failed to care for God's children. Um, this feels especially appropriate this week in light of in light of um, just personally and as a church. Join me in this prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. My heart needs a, a surgeon. My soul needs. 
needs a friend, so I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Uh, I was looking at like the behind the music where Matt Marr, the, the author of the song, talks about it. He said, you know, there was this day where uh, his, his son had fell down and, and skinned his knee and uh, he got up and he ran to his dad, right, and said, make it better. Uh, and he said, whenever he hears his kids crying, what's his initial response as a, as a parent? He wants, he wants to go to them. Now, my wife embodies that more than me. Like, when I hear it, I'm like, they're fine, just spit on it, you know, it'll be, you know, whatever. So she's better. She's better at doing that. She embodies that in our house a little bit better. But yeah, we have this, this inclination when something happens, we want to run to our children. And he said, God is, is that kind of a parent. Uh, where even even before we realize that anything's wrong, God has already run to us. Uh, and Shelby said it in our prayer of confession. While we were yet sinners, while we were still a long way off, God the Father ran to us in Christ Jesus uh, to share that love. And so what a, what a beautiful song. Um, and if your heart needs a surgeon today, I think it's found one uh, in, in the grace of the Savior and the love of Jesus Christ. Uh, revealing the love of God for us. So, uh, if you have your Bible, grab it with me. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be doing a little bit of jumping today uh, in Jeremiah and Isaiah and some of the prophets. Uh, Jeremiah thirty one is is where we're gonna start. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we can leave that up there, James. Uh, we've been we've been on this journey with God from the very beginning of the Scriptures uh, in the book of the beginnings in Genesis. We see that the covenant with Noah and then the covenant with Abraham, and then we get into Exodus. We have the Mosaic covenant. And this is kind of a conditional covenant. God says, listen, I want you to be my people. I want you to reflect my, my business, your world. Uh, and if you do that, if you follow this covenant, then one, you're going to inherit this land uh, that's flowing with milk and honey. But two, you're going to have the, the blessing of my presence uh, to be with you. And, and you're going to reflect me in the world. However, if you don't do these things, if you don't follow my commands, if you don't reflect my character in the world, then... It's not going to go well with you. Like, so there's this, there's this balance. I want you to do these things. I want you to reflect me. I want you to be my people. If you don't do these things, then these things that are meant to be a blessing are actually going to be more of a curse to you, right? And so then we get into the Davidic covenant last week. And we looked at uh, the promise of God again and again. Uh, the people strayed from God's way, right? And God continually remakes covenant, delivers them. And, and so uh, today we're actually getting to the book of Jeremiah, the only place in the whole of the Old Testament where there's a promised new covenant. Now, there, there are all kinds of allusions that are made to it, but Jeremiah 31 is, is the only one I know of where he says, listen, there's a new covenant that God is making. And as we go on this journey, uh, my hope is that we move from uh, head knowledge, knowledge about God, to heart knowledge, knowledge of God. Knowledge of a God who loves us and claims us and forgives us and restores us and redeems us. And so as we, as we make this journey, uh, this is the phrase. I, I invite you to read it with me. The longest journey you'll ever make is the journey from the head to the heart. The 18 inches of space, the head to the heart, is the longest journey you'll take. It's one thing to know about God. It's one thing to know the stories, to know the covenants, to come to worship. It's an entirely another thing to know God. And to know God is to love God. And so what does that mean? What does that look like? We're going to hear a little bit about it today. So uh, this is the book of Jeremiah. The context we're going to get into in the service. But, but suffice it to say this. The people have strayed once again. And they've ended up in exile. And everything that they've loved, everything that they valued from place to people to city to temple has been robbed from them and it's been destroyed and now they find themselves enslaved again this time not in Egypt but in Babylon and it's it's in that context that the prophet speaks these words of hope so may you be blessed as you give attention to me and your I'm going to I'm going to go back a few verses is that okay it's not on the screen sorry this is uh, 31 verse 1, because I, I just, I want us to hear uh, this too. At that time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. This is in exile. This is 
ripped from everything of meaning from their lives. Jeremiah says, at that time, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the race in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. I have loved you with everlasting love. I have continued my faithfulness to you. Jumping ahead to verse 31, this is what's on the screen. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the northern and the southern kingdoms. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them. Everybody say within. within. And I will write on their hearts. And I will be God, and they will be my people. And no longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Everybody say forgive. forgive. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks, be, to God. Thanks be to God. Well, as we jump in here, I'm excited to explore and see what God has in store for us. But will you join me in a word of prayer? Good and gracious God. You are far more ready to speak to us than we are to listen, far more capable to forgive us than we are to be honest and to confess our sin. And so it's in gratitude that we receive your mercy and grace that's made new with the every morning. And we invite you once again to speak your truth of grace and forgiveness to us. Open our eyes that we might see you running towards us. Open our ears that we might hear you calling our name. Open our hearts that we might make room for your love that's written upon our hearts. And then open our hands that we might share the love that we received with the world. For we ask this in the name of Jesus, our risen and As people said, amen. amen. Uh, there's uh, a theme this, that ties this, this great thread of covenants together. It's the word chesed. Will you guys say it with me? Chesed. chesed. If, uh, if you aren't getting some uh, moisture in the front of your mask when you say it, you're not saying it right, right? Chesed. Uh, chesed is this theme of everlasting love. It's this theme of covenant faithfulness. It's this theme of grace and mercy. It encompasses all of those things tied in together. And, and this is the theme that, that ties uh, the covenants from Abraham and Noah to Moses to David to the promised new covenant that, that Jeremiah speaks of. This is the theme that ties them all together. Uh, when I come to worship, one of the first words I say is, good morning, beautiful people of God. And I remind you that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That no matter how you got up this morning and when you look in the mirror, whatever you see, warts and wrinkles that are, you are beloved and beautiful in the eyes of God, who claims you as his own. Uh, a friend of mine named Adam, I love Adam, Adam opens worship every Sunday with these words, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> it's stunning to go to worship with him, because you, you sit in these pews and as he gets up there after the music is played, he says, church, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. And right from the beginning of the worship service, you know what happens? Your memory explodes with the unconditional love of the God who he claims. Right? Because this love that Adam wants to share with the church is the love that he has received from his God. An unconditional love. No strings attached. Listen, this love says, there's nothing you can do to make me love you any less. Regardless of how far you've strayed, regardless of what you undone, there's nothing you could do to make God love you any less. And on the other side of that, there's nothing you could do to make God love you any more. No matter how faithful or obedient or kind or just you are, you can't make God love you any more. 
And you know why? Because God is love. That's what John tells us, right? Love isn't just what God does, it's who God is. So it, it's, it's as if there was never a time in the universe where God wasn't loving. Sometimes I think we put God on one of those spinny office chairs, you know what I'm talking about? Where you sit there and when you're obedient and when you're good and when you're kind and when you're truthful and you're just, and you're doing all the right things in just the right ways, God is facing you and God loves you and he says, I'm so proud of you, well done. But then as soon as you stray, as soon as you wander from the path, as soon as you don't practice justice or love mercy or act in kindness, what does God do in your head? Mm -hmm. Turns right around in that spinny chair and says, nope, I'm not happy, right? Sometimes I think in our heads, that's the image of God we have, and yet the image of God proclaimed in the scripture is that God is love. That there's never been a time where God wasn't love. That God loves you unconditionally, no strings attached, not contingent upon how you behave or act. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. That's the message of the scriptures. That's the message we hear in this passage from the book of Jeremiah. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do to make me love you any more. Nothing you can do to make me love you any less. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Sisters and brothers, that's some pretty good news. And it's especially good news if you're Israel, because we've been following along. We know their journey. We know who they're called to be. Just think back to last week's sermon, the cycle of the judges, the cycle of salvation found in the judges. What is Israel's behavior? Do they keep covenant? No. No. They wander as far off the path as they could possibly go. And today, when we get to the book of Jeremiah, this cycle, it just continues. And so we're thinking, is there anything that can break through the hardness of the hearts of the people of Israel? Is there anything that can break through the stubbornness that they continually cling to? Is there anything that can change them from the inside out? Moses wondered this at the very beginning of the covenant. The book of Exodus, Moses says, after God gives them the commandments, after the people have made the golden calf... After God has renewed covenant, Moses says, circumcise your hearts. It's not just an outward symbol. It's not just an outward thing that we want to do. This is something internally that we want you to receive and to be made new. We want transformation to take place in the heart level, in this innermost being. And so that's been the call from the very beginning. That's been the call that Moses put on the people, but the people have continually wondered and straight. They've got these hard hearts, and so we're left to wonder, is there anything that can change them? And maybe you're sitting here today asking the same question of yourself. Is there anything, is there anything that can, can make it alive? Is there anything that can make me and transform me into somebody new? That's, that's the question that Israel's wrestling with. Uh, remember where we found Israel. We found Israel in slaved in the land of Egypt. And when we pick up the book of Jeremiah, they found themselves back as slaves, but this time not in Egypt, this time in the land of Babylon. And uh, exile is not, uh, it's not a comfortable place. It's not a good place. They have been stripped of, of their family, of their friends. Uh, their whole city of Jerusalem was besieged by Babylon. Uh, Babylon wanted them to give up, didn't want to, didn't, they didn't mind if they lost Israelites' lives. Uh, they would rather take their money, they would rather take their influence, their power, their ingenuity, their minds, and they would take them off to Babylon, and they would uh, strip them from place, and they would want to learn from them. Say, hey, come to Babylon, we're going we're gonna to use your resources, use your ingenuity, we're going to take the best of the brightest out of Israel, out of Jerusalem, we're going to enslave you in Babylon. Uh, life's not going to be bad there, but you're just not going to be free, right? And so that's what happens. Israel gives up. Their city was besieged. They ran out of food. They ran out of water. They said, we can't do this. We can't keep fighting. They gave up. Their, their whole city was destroyed. Their temple was destroyed. The best and the brightest of Israel were taken off into Babylon, into exile. So much so that uh, the prophets said, you know, listen, we, we hung our harps 
by the rivers of Babylon because they wanted us to sing, but how could we sing when we were slaves in a foreign land? There were no songs to sing in Israel. They were exiled. And Israel was wrestling with, where is God in the midst of this? Where is God? We've been stripped from our land, from our place where we belong. We've been stripped from Jerusalem, from our city. We've been stripped from temple and worship. We're slaves again. Where is God in the midst of this? If God lives in temple, if that's God's place, now the temple has been destroyed, now that we've been removed from temple, now that we've been removed from place, where is God? This is where Jesus is but it's not before the, the hopelessness of exile sets in. If you're in a hopeless space today, maybe it's mental energy, maybe it's physical, maybe it's emotional, maybe it's spiritual, if you, if you just feel like, I'm kind of in this space of despair. You're not alone. This week, I was wrestling with those kinds of... I think the mess of COVID that we've been in, plus racial injustice, plus these acts of violence, this week that came out in the Asian community, against the Asian community, like, I just felt hopeless this week. And if that's you, you're not alone. And maybe you're asking, where is God in the midst of this? You know what Jeremiah told the people of Israel? That they're at the end of your rope, in the midst of your hopelessness, even in the despair of exile, God is present. You know why? Because God refuses to be God without you. That's the best news I got. You wander away, you find yourself in the middle of the miry pit, you know what God does? He leaves temple. He leaves space. And he says, I am where my people are. That's what Israel encountered in exile. God isn't tied to Jerusalem. God isn't tied to temple. Who's God tied to? God's people. And if my people are in despair, in exile, where's God going to be? Right there. So whatever pit you find yourself in, whatever despair you're going through, whatever sense of hopelessness you've got, here's the best news I've got. You're not alone. God enters into the depths of your despair simply to be with you. So that you might know that wherever you are, God is there. There's no pit so far deep down that you can escape the presence of God. God is there. Not only is God there... But God is doing a new thing. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Everybody say new. New, new. new covenant with you. A new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, will not be like the old covenant I made with their ancestors. I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was there. I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. Everybody say within. I will write it on their hearts. This new thing that God is doing, it happens right in the midst of our despair. It happens as we hit rock bottom. God shows up and we realize that God hasn't abandoned us. God hasn't left us. God has been there all along. Even when we did our worst, even when we strayed as far away as we could, God said, you can't get rid of me. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God climbs right down into the pit and says, listen up, Israel. I'm about to do a new thing. And it's not like the old thing, because you kept breaking that thing. You kept straying. You kept uh, disobeying the commands of the law. Uh, you were meant to reflect me. You were meant to be mirrors of my ways into the world, but people didn't see me, when they looked at you, they saw people who wandered from God. And so I'm going to do a new thing. And I'm going to write my law on your hearts. You see, it was written on tablets of stone. Well, the stone, it just it changed from this external thing to an internal thing, right? Those hard hearts that you've got, Israel, I'm going to write my law right there. And maybe that will soften. Maybe that will change you. 
I'm going to do something new in your midst. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. This is the promise of God. And this is a promise that they receive at the end of their rope. This is a promise while they're in the tomb. They haven't been resurrected yet. They aren't freed from exile yet. But God said, there's a day that's coming. There's a day that's coming when the darkness of the tomb will, will be like a womb and you will spring to new life. There's a day that's coming when you're going to exchange all of this despair for hope unending. I'm going to do something new. And you know what the center of this new thing is? The law doesn't change. So the 613 commandments that we get from the beginning of the Old Testament all the way to the end, that doesn't change. You know what does change? The way that it's transmissed, the way that it's passed to Israel. They're not going to have teachers that are going to tell them about it. They're not going to have uh, to know God. You know why? Because it's written on their hearts. God's going to do something so gracious and so moving that it's going to stir even the hardest hearts in Israel. And he's going to write his law on the flesh and bone of their heart, right? They're going to be transformed from the inside out. Law doesn't change. God still wants covenant partners. God still wants a community to reflect his goodness and justice and beauty and love in the world. But the way that it's going to happen, this is what Jeremiah says. Jeremiah 34. Or 31, excuse me, 34. Clarify. I will forgive. Everybody say forgive. I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. You know what the heart of the new covenant is? Forgiveness. The only way to make a way where there is no way? Forgiveness. The only way to restore this people who are so wayward and so hard-hearted that they continue to stray from a God who loves them? Forgiveness. The only way to give them a new heart is for God to reveal the depths of God's heart to them. I will forgive you and remember your sins no more. Not only does God forgive, but he forgets. That's the heartbeat of the God who loves and claims us. Forgiveness. I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. No matter how far you stray or wander, you can't exhaust my goodness or grace. No matter how good or righteous you are, I can't. I can't love you any more than I already do. Why? Because God is love. The heart of this new covenant is forgiveness. And it's as if Israel receives a heart transplant. Their wayward and wandering hearts are replaced with the very heartbeat of God who forgives. And we said it, we said it in our prayer this morning, our prayer of confession. While we were yet sinners, while we were still a long way off from God, what happened? God came near to us in Christ Jesus. God forgave us once for all. Forgiveness. What is it that writes the law on the hearts of Israel? Forgiveness. Here's... Uh, this is from the book of Isaiah. This is uh, stuck with me. I ran across this a couple years ago on Easter Sunday of all days. This is Psalm 49, 16. If you can see it up there, will you read it with me? See, I have engraved you in the palm of my hand. The God of the universe says there's only one way I know to write my law upon their hearts. And that's if I write their names on the palm of my hands. In the 
person of Jesus in his incarnation, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, we see the heartbeat of God that has never changed and has never wavered and has been faithful to us to the end. We see the reality that God would rather die than be God without us. We see that the, the heartbeat of the new covenant is none other than the heartbeat of God himself who gives God's self that we might be forgiven, that our sins might be forgotten. The only way God knew how to write on our hearts of stone the law was to give his own heart to us. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. No matter how far you wander, no matter how far off course you stray, no matter what you've done or what you've left undone, I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. This forgiveness is preemptive. Even before we knew we needed forgiveness, even before we had the inclination to turn and confess and go and, and ask God to forgive us and make us new, God was already running after us in the person of Jesus Christ. While we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus gave his life for us, revealing the heart. Sisters and brothers, in the cross of Christ, it's as if God says, I love you, and there's nothing you can do with that. Well, actually, there is one thing. You can believe it. You can receive it. You can be it. You can embody that kind of steadfast love in the world. that when I contemplate the love of God in Jesus, it feels like there's something stirring in my chest. It feels like even this heart of stone might begin to beat again. Beat again with the rhythms of God's own love. Rhythms of justice. Rhythms of mercy. Rhythms of forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as you're able. And uh, we're going to join our, our hearts in song. This is a song called Change My Heart, O God. And we're going to have the lyrics on the screen. And I invite this to be your prayer. As you hear about God's heart, as you encounter God's great love and preemptive forgiveness, as you meditate and reflect on the idea that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. May it lead to an inner transformation.
all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, as you leave worship, uh, a reminder that we have the offering plate at the back door. We invite you to leave your offerings as you go. Uh, the offering is a space where we give back to God out of the abundance that God has given to us. We acknowledge that all of life is a gift, and we give back to God out of that great gift. So I invite you to do that with us. We couldn't be the church without your faithful presence and continue to support. So thank you for doing that. Sisters and brothers, say with me. I love you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing you can do about it. Today as you leave, may the love of God surround you. I don't know what she said, but I'm glad she said it. Today as you leave, may the love of God surround you. May the presence of Christ, your true older brother, be a faithful guide. May the presence of the Spirit stir your heart of stone and change you from the inside out. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.